You're listening to Medscape's In Discussion series on cancer survivorship, a podcast where thought leaders and clinical experts share their diverse insights and practical ideas for optimizing patient care. This series is hosted by Dr. Anne Partridge, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Vice Chair of Medical Oncology, Founder and Director of the Program for Young Adults with Breast Cancer, Director of the Adult Cancer Survivorship Program, and Eric P. Weiner, MD, Chair in Breast Cancer Research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Relevant disclosures can be found with the episode show notes on Medscape.com or the Medscape app. The topics and discussions are planned, produced, and reviewed independently of advertisers. This podcast is intended only for U.S. healthcare professionals. Hello, I'm Dr. Ann Partridge from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Welcome to Medscape's In Discussion series on cancer survivorship. Today, we'll discuss the state of cancer survivorship research and care, which is an increasingly important issue given that the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with cancer today will live through and beyond the cancer, often for many years. But first, let me introduce you to my guest, Dr. Patricia Gans, Dr. Gans is a medical oncologist and director of the Cancer Prevention and Control Research at the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center in LA and a pioneer in the assessment of quality of life in cancer patients. Welcome to In Discussion, Patty. It's great to be with you, Anne. Yeah, it's just so great to have you on this discussion in particular. And I ask each of my guests, you know, what brought you to this specialty? What first drew you in? You, I'm going to ask, what made you create this specialty? Because you really were at the forefront of defining cancer survivorship as a field. Well, in the early days, way back in the late 1970s and early 80s, um, most of the people that we treated, and of course, I was at a VA hospital, so I was seeing mostly men with lung, colon, prostate cancer, all pretty advanced. And they didn't live very long. And I actually ran a palliative care, hospice, supportive care, rehab unit, and was able to do a lot for these patients. But gradually over time in my practice, both at the county hospital and at UCLA, I was beginning to see more people coming back after completing often very complex and morbid surgical radiation and chemotherapies, complaining that they were suffering, but there was no disease there. And confronted with these patients, I had to say, gee, don't we have to do something for them? Don't we have to care for them? And they really taught me a lot. And that's really how I got interested in making sure people who had finished their treatment would have as good a life as possible. Patty, I love it. I love that you meet the patients where they are. And as you get more survivors, they, you see the, the new and emerging needs. And, and you and I both focus on, on breast cancer a lot. And I think back then, especially, there was kind of the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am treatment approach, even for people who were you know, highly likely to be cured. And is that where you kind of started to see the aftermath? Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at women who had had mastectomies with their ribs showing and arm mobility that was horrible. I mean, focusing on rehabilitation was really important then. Patients who had sarcomas had limb amputations. You know, we now do preservation. So there were tremendous morbidities. And of course, cancer treatment has improved so much that we have benefited from doing limb sparing, voice salvage for people with laryngeal cancer, et cetera, et cetera. But it means you actually give much more intensive chemo radiation um, to preserve those organs. And so there's still morbidity, even though you're not doing huge surgical procedures. So I think there's a cost, and that's what we have to deal with. It's the price of cure. And we have to be cognizant that life after a cancer diagnosis will never be the same for most people. Let's expand on that a little bit. So I live in the breast cancer world, but I try to develop programs for patients with all kinds of cancer history. Tell me, what, where are the populations growing the most? Who are the largest groups of cancer survivors and what's growing? You know, obviously we wish nobody had cancer, but we want everybody who, if they have cancer, to become, you know, a part of the survivor population. So what are we seeing there from a demographic standpoint? Well, there are two important issues. First, we have what's called the silver tsunami, which is 
10,000 people turning 65 every day from the baby boom generation. And they're going to be living uh, probably into their 70s and 80s. And they are going to be screened for cancer because all of our screening guidelines uh, say, you know, you get screened for colon, now lung cancer, breast cancer. And many of them are going to be picked up with early stage disease, which is going to be curable. So they're going to be living a long time and with, again, a huge boost or increase in the uh, incidence of cancer just because people are getting older. It won't be an increase if you control it for the denominator of age, but just the absolute numbers of people. But we're also worried about uh, younger folks uh, and things that we are seeing now are an increase in early breast cancer, an increase in early colon cancer, many obesity-related cancers like liver cancer, uh, myeloma, thyroid cancer, and so forth. And we know that obesity is a big problem in children and young adults. We see this because of diseases like diabetes that are occurring much earlier in these individuals. And we are going to see uh, cancer as a collateral piece uh, to all of this. So uh, we're going to be watching these kinds of statistics as well uh, in younger people, meaning people less than 50 years of age. Yeah, I want to get back to the health behaviors and what got people maybe at higher risk of getting cancer might lead them to a second cancer in a few minutes. But I, one of my favorite parts in the last decade about talking about cancer survivors is the other group of survivors of diseases where it used to be such an intractable problem like melanoma that had metastasized and some lung cancers. And now we also you know, see large groups of those patients living even with a history of metastatic disease in this long-term survivor phase. What's your take on that and what we need to be thinking differently as we take care of these patients? Sure. I mean, a lot of us positioned ourselves doing survivorship uh, following Fitzhugh Mullins' piece on the seasons of survival and looking at people who were post-treatment who did not have a recurrence, but who were living with those morbidities. And that was a really important call to action. But you're absolutely right with the large number of individuals living with diseases that are metastatic at diagnosis but can be controlled for very long periods of time are a whole new population. You know, think about patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia who are on uh, targeted therapies you know, indefinitely. Even our patients who may have metastatic breast cancer that's HER2 positive being on indefinite targeted therapies. This is just a new world that we are living through and trying to figure out how to manage not only the side effects of the disease and having frequent visits to the healthcare setting, but the financial toxicity also of this um, living with cancer as a chronic disease on medication. Yeah, no, it's tremendous, tremendous burden on the patient, their family, and the healthcare system, and as well as society. Let's, let's focus a few minutes, though, on the special needs of survivors, kind of distinct from people in the active therapy component of their care particularly an area that I know you focused on, you know, secondary cancer prevention and the risk for second malignancies, uh, as well as the risk of comorbid conditions for other important organs. Yeah. So I have my three Ps for survivorship care. Um, the first is palliation. Um, we have to disassociate palliation from end-of-life care because palliative care is really symptom management wherever a person is in any disease process. And for survivors, um, they are often left with neuropathy, pain, um, psychosocial distress, many other symptoms uh, that just won't go away, and fatigue, cognitive difficulties, um, insomnia, uh, which can be very disruptive to ongoing uh, living uh, taking care of their families. If they're a caregiver for an older person in their family, it can be very difficult. And so we have to find ways, and we have a lot of uh, ways, we have a lot of guidelines that give us advice on how to manage fatigue, insomnia, pain, psychological distress, and so forth, and some that we don't have symptomatic relief for, like neuropathy, which is very difficult. Um, but we need to acknowledge when a survivor has a symptom that it's not just all in their head, um, that they shouldn't just be grateful to be alive. They've been through an arduous journey with their treatments, and these are things that we as clinicians and oncologists have to recognize we were partially responsible for. So that's the palliation. Then there's 
prevention, which I think is really important, and it particularly is relevant for second uh, malignancies. It's amazing that even with what we know about genetic testing for hereditary cancers, that many survivors, breast cancer is a very excellent example, or colon cancer, have not been themselves tested to see if they have a hereditary predisposition gene. Um, you know, they've been treated for their cancer, but it's now 10 years later, and nobody has updated genetic testing if they had it or they haven't had it at all. When we know that these predisposition genes may lead to other second or third cancers, which we could be screening for, or in the case of, say, with a colon cancer predisposition genes, removing the uterus, if you will, in somebody, uh, a woman who may be carrying one of these genes, even if she had colon cancer. So that's very important not to miss that opportunity but then screening, and often we need to do screening at an earlier age because people who've had radiation exposure, particularly to visceral organs, could be at risk for lung cancer, esophageal and upper gastrointestinal cancers, colon cancers. I've seen Hodgkin survivors with colon cancer, uh, radiation-induced. And so, again, skin cancers, uh, again, m more common. We need to put this on our list as something that needs to be screened for and alerting the patient to it because often he or she will be the first to notice something. And then uh, along with this, screening and early detection. And if there are any preventive strategies, say for women who may have had chest radiation in their teens and 20s and early 30s, considering tamoxifen for breast cancer prevention as a strategy. Um, so we need to think of them as a truly high-risk group, which they are. And the data do show if you're over 65, there's about a 30% chance you'll get another second cancer if you're surviving. And if you're younger, it could be 15 or 20%, but still that's over the lifetime and um, means being on the lookout. And finally, health promotion. Um, we know that comorbidities are much more common in survivors of cancer and when you compare them to age match general population samples. And we know that they may be at higher risk for very serious problems, such as coronary artery disease after radiation to the chest, or with the anthracyclines, cardiotoxicity that may occur. And in breast cancer, where we both work, we don't exactly know why, but uh, women with breast cancer, even if we didn't use cardiotoxic drugs or radiation, uh, they seem to have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease uh, compared to age matched women, even though we can't really identify. Uh, the risk factors. So looking out for that may be important. And I know you and I are very interested in uh, early menopause that may be provoking some of this in women with breast cancer. So are many of our treatments, which we give with good intention to create more survivors, and hopefully we'll only give them if they're truly worth the bang for the buck, we need to manage the long-term late effects. And as, as you alluded to, it can be hormonal, it can be chemotherapy, it can be radiation therapy, it can be surgery, all of the modalities that we frequently use and sometimes in combination depending on the cancer. So important. Um, I want to touch on now that big organ in the middle of people's chests, the heart, right? It is super important that we take care of our hearts and that uh, is the number one killer of Americans, both men and women. And most people are going to live through their cancer and therefore likely or more likely die of heart disease, uh, assuming they make it through their cancer. Uh, that's why I tell my patients frequently when I'm trying to get them to exercise. So how, how are you thinking about that, both in the care of your patients as well as in your recent research endeavors? I think it's very difficult for many of our patients to realize that they are going to survive and that's going to even be a problem. So sometimes when I've begun to talk about what I would call energy balance, uh, weight maintenance, and physical activity, because the two really go hand in hand. There's a lot of inertia. You know, maybe when they make it then out to eight or 10 years, they'll bite the bullet and do something about it. Um, but really informing them, um, having them work with a cardio-oncologist, or at least an oncologist, who understands that there's earlier onset cardiovascular disease in these individuals to perhaps use um, medications like statins at a, an earlier time point um, because of that higher risk. And also blood pressure control, all of these things are very important. Smoking and tobacco control is very, very important. But the data do not suggest that survivors are any more uh, attracted to these lifestyle uh, interventions than the general public. So I think it's the issue of how we motivate people and give them 
the enthusiasm, if you will, for making these lifestyle changes. It's not easy for anyone. And I think when survivors are burdened with neuropathy and they're worried about falling, you know, to get them out there exercising, maybe difficult. Maybe they have to work with a trainer. Maybe they have to figure out an exercise regimen that will fit whatever the constraints they have from the cancer treatment. Yeah, I've heard my colleague Jennifer Ligabel, who does a lot of research in this area, say, you know, I really want to be able to write a prescription for cancer rehab just the way we write prescriptions and and it's in reimbursed for um, cardiac rehab, right? You'd never think of just sending someone out after a heart attack to go fly, be free, exercise, and take care of your health behaviors on your own. And yet we, we, we seem to do that in the you know general population after a significant cancer diagnosis and treatment. Well, we've had a hard time. I mean, when I first started out, I called what I was doing cancer rehabilitation because it did come out of the early National Cancer Act rehabilitation programs. But what happened was Medicare, in its wisdom, decided not to reimburse cancer as a diagnosis for rehabilitation. But if we could re reinvigorate that as an activity and make cancer rehabilitation part of that prescription, it would be very important. And it's just hard, the reimbursement for this and the organization of good rehab for um, survivors is not um, frequently available. Yeah, it's very challenging. I actually do pretend to be writing a prescription, and sometimes I do write it down with my patients, and I print things out for how much I want them to exercise or you know, certainly to, to get that energy balance that we're seeking. And there is a lot of research going on right now trying to not just see that it's important, uh, but also to say, how can we get patients um, to get motivated, to get the resources they need and the coaching they need to actually do the health behaviors and modify? And we know that behavior changes is some of the hardest. That leads me to one of the biggest buckets of survivorship care, which you alluded to at the beginning of this discussion, which is the psychosocial burden. It's the emotional for the patient. And many people just think about that. But I think there's just so much more for the patient's system, the patient's loved ones, family, brothers, sisters, children, um, workplaces sometimes. Um, and then there's the kind of personal financial toxicity that you alluded to, as well as the system toxicities. It feels very overwhelming when you think about it. How do you chunk that out, uh, both in, in practice and care? I think it's very important for patients to know that we as clinicians are aware that this is a problem, that we need to do regular assessments of how they're, they're doing in terms of their, of their emotional well-being. And um, while um, distress screening has been popularized as being something that should be implemented in care. It is not routinely used. And I think just asking patients about how are they doing using a screening instrument. I, I happen to use the PHQ-9 in my survivorship consults because um, not only can I score it and see if the patient has any evidence of depression, but it has questions about fatigue. It has questions about sleep. It has questions about eating. And it, I can just look at the questionnaire and say, ah, you know, you're, you're not depressed, but I see you're having problems in these other areas. And these are things that we can do something about. And I think patients often feel they don't want to bother their doctor. Their doctor's too busy. They see all the sick patients in the waiting room and they don't want to take up their time. So there's kind of a, um, a veil of silence uh, that goes on when in fact, it's only when they're very seriously depressed or worried um, that they bring these things up. So I think we, we need to be uh, proactive. This has to do with their sex lives, intimate relationships, all sorts of things that um, kind of unravel sometimes after a cancer diagnosis. And maybe we can't fix it, but we can refer them to someone who can help them. So it's a major gap in the care that we provide. I think you're absolutely right. And I think the answer, at least to understanding it better, is the screening. Uh, we know that patients are more likely to bring up these issues when they're asked, right? And sometimes in the middle of a busy clinic, it's hard to, especially for oncologists to not necessarily remember, but want to, you know, bring something up if the patient seems okay, right? And if they're not complaining, it's a little bit of reactive versus proactive care, um, especially when it comes to things like sexual health too, 
I used to call it the eyeball Karnofsky. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I did an early paper that I published with a psychologist and psychiatrist where I was rating the Karnofsky and they were rating the Karnofsky and they were always much lower than me. And I said, well, how, how did you rate your Karnofsky score? This is a, an important scale, at least in terms of performance status. We use the ECOG as well. And they said, well, we just asked them questions about what they were doing, you know? And, um, well, it, it turns out, we tend to say, oh, they're dressed well, they drove here, they're smiling, oh, they're doing okay. But, you know, if you ask a few questions, you find out that things are not quite so good. I just also wanted to mention, I was working with a, uh, some younger cancer survivors a few years ago, and uh, one young woman who was a leukemia uh, survivor basically said, you know, she was six, seven, eight years out, and she said, it takes me more effort to manage my post-treatment com comorbid conditions than it did when I had leukemia, which was pretty shocking, you know, thinking she was hospitalized for a month or more and had many years of treatment. But the bottom line is people are left with a great health burden often, um, which, uh, again, we don't think about. We just think about the fact that they're disease-free. Yeah. No, I'm always, I am struck by that, particularly... Um you know, for certain experiences like bone marrow transplant or, you know, multimodality therapy or therapies to a particularly sensitive area of, of the body. It's fascinating. So many of us do have specialized survivorship clinics where we can send our patients. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing where somebody can just pay attention to all of the treatment related toxicities, the long term late effects and the psychosocial. Um, but what kinds of resources are out there that you're aware of for people who don't have the luxury of being able to get into a big cancer center or a larger survivorship program? You know, I, I think the big fear that most oncologists have is it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell. For instance, for the psychosocial services, if I don't have someone I can refer the patient to, well, I'm afraid to ask about it. Um, they are much more willing uh, to ask about physical symptoms and things like insomnia or you know, some pain where they can prescribe something. But my experience is that they're just not familiar with many of the behavioral intervention resources. And the integrative oncology resources are phenomenal. Many times um, they're very effective in terms of treating fatigue and insomnia, cognitive behavioral therapy. All of these things have a, a really rich evidence base. So I think we need to encourage kind of knowing your surroundings, knowing the resources in your community, many community cancer centers actually have a lot of these things available, and to link them to some form of assessment that you feel comfortable doing, because you know if the person has a positive or affirmative response, you can offer them something that will be really appreciated. Yeah, I think that's that's really, really good advice. So Patty, this has really been incredible. I always love speaking with you, especially about this area, which again, you really helped to create and, and support and foster for so many of us. Today, we've been talking with Dr. Patricia Gans or Patty, um, talking about cancer survivorship, a field that emerged over the last 30 years and is fortunately really growing in terms of our understanding, uh, the research that's been going on to inform how we can better care for our patients. Uh, and that population is is growing in many different ways, including people living with cancer in kind of a new model of, of survivorship. Thank you for tuning in. Please take a moment to download the Medscape mobile app to listen and subscribe to this podcast series on cancer survivorship. This is Dr. Ann Partridge for In Discussion. Thanks for listening to Medscape's In Discussion Cancer Survivorship podcast series with our host, Dr. Ann Partridge. Be sure to look for more In Discussion episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Medscape.com or the Medscape app for show notes, links, and more information on cancer survivorship.